Sir S.W. Tapley Seaton, Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Timothy Harris, family, friends, my wife Mary, whom I'm happy to have back once again, have she having gone through her period of um, quarantine. And all my children, join with me in extending heartfelt condolences to the family of our dear departed brother. His mortal life is ended, but his light will shine on in perpetuity in the hearts and minds of the myriads of people he helped and advised and mentored, and more so for his family, with whom many special memories will last forever. Richard Llewellyn Keynes was the first son of Moses Llewellyn Keynes, a carpenter, and his wife Mary. And when he was born in Dieppe on 4th of October 1932, there were already two older sisters in the family. By the end of 1939, three more girls were added. So Richard now had five sisters. A brief attendance at the Dieppe Bay Primary School was curtailed early in 1940 when the family moved to Bastia and settled in Central Street in McKnight. Richard was barely eight years old. However, Dieppe Bay continued to be there for the fun times and all school vacations when he and his siblings would be making long visits with the grandparents. Many years later, the fellows, including me, would hang out on Richard's veranda in Dieppe Bay on Sunday afternoons and on holidays. In Bastia, he attended the Bastia Boys School and proudly was responsible for three of his sisters who he had to accompany, guard, and deliver to the nearby Bastia Girls' School. He was given one non-negotiable rule by his father. You must leave home together, come back together, and be in your yard by 4 o'clock. In Bastia, the parents quickly gave birth to another girl and later two boys. With a total of six sisters, Richard was charmed, and he believed that God had given him the six sisters for him to personally guide, guard, and protect. And he declared it was his job. He was 12 years old when he finally got a brother. Although he was happy, he never got as attached to the brother since he was busy with his God-given job, managing and steering the sisters he loved. Interestingly, boys at the Bastia Boys School had to have occasional fights after school. He was concerned that when he would be in a fight, based on his father's rule, his sisters could not go home without him. He solved it thus. When he had to fight, he would take off his shirt, give it to the sisters to hold along with any books, and they would have to wait and watch until the fight was over. Life in Central Street was about music. The sisters had music lessons, but Richard learned to play by ear and was the greatest on the organ and later the piano. He was the musical director for his sisters to learn and sing all the songs and choruses of the day to the enjoyment of neighbors who would gather at nights on the sidewalk to enjoy the activity. There were no radios or TVs in those days. 
I know that this revelation of Richard the musician would surprise many people today, just as it did many years later when Richard rendered an organ solo and also accompanied um, by Zilla Plass, an outstanding male vocalist, during a fundraising concert at PAM headquarters. This took place at a time when PAM headquarters was always a beehive of activity. A parent's nightmare in those early days was that boys would indulge in the dangerous activity of going up the line and jumping on the trains just for the ride or pulling cane from the carts as the engine was speeding on its way to or from the factory. Richard was no exception, but he had to regard the rule of his father or else he remembered that his sisters could not go home without him. So he solved that also. At a convenient location, he would jump onto a cart of the train and advise his sisters to run behind the train up to his next chosen location where he would get off. The kitchen and dining room was the center of Richard's family. That was the time for storytelling, jokes, discussions, learning and acquiring moral and ethical manners, and all with food, lots of food. Richard liked it to be said, he ate well, and he really did. On completing the Bastet Boys School, Richard entered the teaching profession as a pupil teacher. He said he tried his best, but that he was not fond of being a teacher. He preferred tinkering with cars, trucks, tractors, anything like that. So at the end of one year, he left teaching and attached himself as an apprentice to the best mechanic shops in Bastia. Through it all, he still held fast to his perceived God-given job to manage, steer, guide, guard, and protect his six sisters. So he never learned how to cook, wash, or do girls' work. Mother Keynes soon had a solution for that. As he was spreading his young adult wings and began exhibiting some signs of rebellion, his mother one day announced to him in stern words, since you're playing man and you think you're a big man, you will have to wash your own clothes. Nobody in here will be washing for you. He decided he could solve that too. So he prepared the washing area, opened as wide as possible the gate to the street from which he would be seen washing. He declared that he was doing this so that everyone passing would see him and cry shame, shame. What a shame on his sisters and his mother. That he had six sisters and had to wash his own clothes. As he excelled as a mechanic, he found work at the Bastia Sugar Factory and became engaged in the Department for Maintenance and Repair of Vehicles. He moved on to owning his own vehicle. Then he stepped up to making it a taxi service for special occasions, like weddings. He even had a sister to drive the brides. Then later, he would rent out his car. This eventually transformed into becoming a car rental business. And his was the first car rental business in St. Kitts. In November of 1964, the government of the day passed a law which mandated that electricity service would be billed not only by the amount used, but in addition by floor space, even if you had a floor 
but no roof or sides. This outraged the populace, and a huge demonstration was organized. Richard was an integral part of the organizing of this electricity demonstration. Since he had this perceived God-given job to manage, direct, and protect his six sisters, he directed and commanded that they must get to the demonstration and be on time. History will, will tell that for Richard, this event was now the beginning of a bigger God-given job. Throughout his life, he was known as a hard-working man. He was always first in and last out of his workplace. I really got to know him when he operated a small garage at the gas station at Victoria Road. The highlight of his time at Victoria Road was not how many vehicles he repaired there or how many apprentices he taught. No, it was the race. With his tremendous sense of humor, Richard bet one of his friends that he, Richard, the non-athlete, could run from the gas station down 4th Street, touch the Treasury Building, and return to the gas station before his friend could eat a two-pence bread without any drink. <laughs> Richard had, wouldn't have had a chance in that race the way bread is not cost nowadays. <laughs> Richard won the race handily. The event attracted persons who were on their way to a first-class football match in Warner Park and caused such a traffic jam on Keon Street that the head of the traffic division, Sergeant Lynch Wade, left the police station and came over to see what the problem was. Needless to say, he too enjoyed the race before clearing the traffic. When I returned from internship in December 1963 and got my first car, Richard was responsible for its maintenance and we became good friends. When he moved to Princess Street, he added the portfolio of businessman to his career path and he became a very astute and successful businessman. As indicated, he started the first car rental enterprise in St. Kitts. With Barry and Evelyn, he ventured into the supply of auto parts as BEC auto parts. Being a mechanic, however, was always his first love. And therein, he has left an amazing legacy. Many of the best mechanics in the Federation learned their trade under the tutelage of Richard Keynes. People like his son Colin Keynes, Bernard Phipps, Charlie Mossenden, Tully, Eric Duport, Mantis, just to name a few. There were two incidents in our lives which we both shared and which in each case changed the course of my life. The first was the electricity demonstration of November 1964. I went to the demonstration intending just to be one more person lost in the crowd of protesters. I ended up carrying the banner in front of the marchers simply because my friend Richard was carrying the banner and he could not carry it alone. At that time, involvement in politics was not even a thought. If I knew then what I know now about the mandate to his sisters, I would simply have asked Richard to designate one of his sisters to carry the battle with him, or even have them all share the task on the trip from the park to government house and back. The second incident occurred in July 1967 in London when we breached the security and invaded the office of the Minister for Overseas Development, Miss Judith Hart. We had gone there to seek the support of the British government 
in calling for the release of the PAM executive and others who were unjustly imprisoned by the Bradshaw regime. Richard was perhaps at greater risk because he barred the door through which we entered against further intrusions. Needless to say, we did meet with Judith Hart. Richard was a founding member of the People's Action Movement and always the first speaker on the platform. He set the tone for the meetings. He was a forceful and persuasive speaker and his material was always thoroughly researched. He was the party historian and his memory of past events and his well-organized archives were legendary. Even on his bed of affliction, people sought him out with requests for information. He was the rock of the People's Action Movement, and he gave of his resources generally, generously for the advancement of the People's Action Movement. When Pam NRP formed the government in 1980, Richard became the junior minister in the Ministry of Finance. He quickly gained the reputation as the guardian of the country's finances. He was appointed chairman of a committee to oversee the use of government vehicles. And he did his job with such vigilance and purpose that he soon became known as the Tekweki minister. A sobriquet well earned as he stopped many miscreants in their tracks and confiscated the keys to vehicles being misused. After the elections of 1984, he was appointed as minister in the Ministry of Finance and served in that capacity until 1993. He introduced the presentation to the cabinet of a monthly summary of the government finances so that all ministers could be fully aware of the state of the government finances at any point in time. He represented St. Kitts and Nevis on numerous occasions on the Monetary Council of the ECCB when, and when Monstrat and also Grenada were experiencing a period of severe financial difficulty. Richard was a member of a task force appointed by the ECCB to go to these countries to assist them through their difficulties. He served the nation also as chairman of the SSMC and chairman of the Social Security Board. Richard Keynes was a great humanitarian. He embodied the PAM philosophy of putting people first in the way he responded to people. Richard Keynes was one of the most generous persons that I have known. And sometimes people took advantage of his generosity. Richard helped political opponents even, who had previously vilified him. On his bed of affliction, Richard Keynes called political leaders to his bedside and entreated them to help some people who were experiencing some very difficult times. Richard loved children. He adopted a class at the William Connor School and the children loved him. Every year he invited the class to his home and apart from ensuring that they were well fed, he invited the Governor General, the Prime Minister, me and some influential persons to meet with the children and share a few words of advice and encouragement with them. He was a devoted Methodist, serving both at Wesley and Hope Chapel. It was Richard who suggested to the Reverend John Gums that the Methodist Church should borrow the money, get Hope Chapel rebuilt, so that the joy and pride in their new church would motivate and inspire the members to greater efforts in raising the money to pay for the church. That loan has long since been repaid. His Methodist foundation was well reflected during his time 
as a social and political commentator in the operating room. He introduced an innovation which was well received. He started to feature a Methodist hymn on the program, explaining the history and origin of the hymn, and then actually singing it. I wish I had that courage. The reviews were outstanding. Many people loved it and looked forward to it, and some even made requests which he accommodated. I want to share a little secret with you. Before I left home this afternoon, I said to Mary, I hope they have John Wesley's hymn on the, on the program, you know. I haven't seen the program. I know it there. I don't see it since I come. The, what we call the Methodist National Anthem. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? And I was very happy when I got the program and saw that it was there. And I look forward to everyone singing it lustily. But I, I, I picture, I picture, as John Wesley may have pictured, Richard Keynes confidently, confidently going forward to the throne of grace. No condemnation now I fear. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Richard Keynes, I can see him now, can go forward with confidence. Above and beyond everything else, all the things he may have done or not done, Richard Keynes was my friend. When I think of Richard, I think of the admonition of Polonius to his son Laertes in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them unto thy soul with hoops of steel. That's the way it was with Richard and me. He has gone. He was not snatched away unwillingly. He was ready. He was taken gently and lovingly. Not because of good works, though of these there were many, but by the grace promised to all of us by a loving and merciful God. May his soul rest in eternal peace.